A very warm welcome, uh, Ministers uh, Mario Marcel, Anna Kaiser Econen, and Pascal Donahue, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends all. A, a very warm welcome to this launch of the 2024 OECD survey on the drivers of trust in public institutions. This is our second edition of this survey and provides a comprehensive stock tag of key drivers of trust in public institutions and citizens' expectations of uh, government reliability, responsiveness, capacity, integrity, fairness, and openness. As part of the OECD's Reinforcing Democracy Initiative, this OECD Trust Survey aims to help governments identify progress and emerging pressures on trust and provide evidence-based guidance and good international practices that strengthen democratic values and institutions. Since the 2021 edition, uh, 10 new countries have participated, bringing the total to 30 countries. Uh, in an increasingly challenging environment marked by successive economic shocks, rising protectionism, a war in Europe, uh, and ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, as well as structural challenges and disruptions caused by rapid technological developments, climate change, and population aging, building and sustaining trust must remain a top priority for democracies around the world. The results of this survey help policymakers identify how public trust is evolving and how it varies across different segments of the population. Importantly, it also identifies opportunities to strengthen public trust through policies, procedures, and communications, and through advice on policy best practice. Across the 30 OECD countries that were surveyed, 44% of respondents have low or no trust in their national government, outweighing the 39% who express high or moderately high levels of trust. For the 18 countries that participated in both editions of this uh, survey, there is an average decline of two percentage points in trust in national governments. However, there are significant differences across countries with notable increases in trust in Australia, Belgium, Canada, Colombia, France, Latvia, and Sweden. Our analysis also finds that trust in government differs across gender and socioeconomic groups. The most significant decline in trust since our last survey is visible among women and among participants with lower levels of education. For these groups, trust in the national government has fallen by at least five percentage points across the 18 countries that participated in both surveys. The share of women reporting no or low levels of trust has in fact increased from 39% in 2021 to 45% in 2023. Similarly, for respondents with lower levels of education, trust in government has dropped from 39% in 21 to 34% just two years later. Citizens' trust is particularly high in their day-to-day -day interactions with public institutions. Respondents who use public services within one year prior to the survey largely perceive the provision of public services to be reliable. Indeed, recent users report relative satisfaction with national health, education, and administrative services. 52% of participants believe that they would be treated fairly if they applied for government benefits or services. In contrast, there is skepticism about whether all institutions and officials work in the public interest. For example, only about 30% of respondents believe their governments can resist corporate influence, and just 32% think the government would adopt the opinions expressed in a public consultation. On average, trust in media is low and is influenced by people's news consumption habits and the evolving the evolution of the media environment. Only 22% uh, only of respondents who do not follow political news report high or moderately high trust in government, compared to 40% of those who follow the news. Uh, concerns over the reliability and integrity of information has grown in recent years, undermining the ability to distinguish accurate from false content. Trust, trust in the media and trust in the national government are moderately correlated at the cross-country level. 
Uh, this report provides concrete recommendations for policymakers to respond mm -hmm. to some of these mm -hmm. challenges and emerging trends. First, promoting more meaningful and inclusive opportunities for citizens to participate in decision-making. People want a greater voice in decision-making to ensure it is fair, evidence-based, accountable, and clearly communicated. This survey shows a 47 percentage point gap in trust in national government between those who feel they have a say in government action and those who do not, which is bigger than the gaps we observed across socioeconomic and demographic groups. On average, 79% of respondents across the participating countries would like to vote on issues of national importance. Ensuring citizens' consultations are more meaningful and following up on the results is important to address doubts about, pub about public institutions' responsiveness to feedback, to strengthen democratic processes and ultimately enhance trust. The OECD Trust Survey provides guidance and identifies countries' efforts to enhance citizens' engagement. Governments can focus on improving civ civic participation by institutionalizing direct and deliberative participation mechanisms. The most extensive consultation method is, of course, the referendum with Switzerland as a well-known example of best practice. And in Ireland, lower levels of trust among youth led to the establishment of youth assemblies to inform policy issues such as those related to climate change and artificial intelligence. Second, strengthening capacity to address long-term policy challenges that involve complex trade-offs. Around 40% of respondents believe the government fairly balances the interests of different generations, will regulate new technologies appropriately, or will succeed in reducing greenhouse gas emissions over the next 10 years. In tackling these challenges, national governments and national parliaments will need to ensure that interests in different regions of a country are incorporated in a decision-making process. As the COVID-19 pandemic illustrated, effective emergency preparedness at both the national and local level are also key for public trust. Third, supporting open information and transparent communications. How we create, share, and consume information is also closely tied to levels of trust. The OECD Trust Survey explores this link for the first time. Our survey shows that governments can earn public trust by better communicating the data and evidence that supports reforms and by clearly explaining how policy changes will affect different groups and why they're being pursued. However, 40% of respondents believe the government is unlikely to explain how policy reform will affect them. And on average, 38% think the government is unlikely to use the best available evidence in their decision making. Sharing the evidence, research and statistics behind government decisions helps ensure transparency and helps improve public perception of the decision making process. For example, the use of digital channels offers public institutions new methods to engage with the public, gather insights to better tailor communication strategies, and help the population be better informed about what government is doing and why. The French government's online application Agora for the direct dialogue between citizens and the government was downloaded 130,000 times and enabled 77,000 people to ask questions to government officials and enabled 42,000 people to take part in online consultations. Fourth, fostering information integrity and transparency standards in policy making processes. Establishing a clearer rules related to integrity and anti-corruption, implementing transparency standards in the process of assembling, analyzing and applying evidence in the policy making processes would all help improve <clears throat> public integrity and the perceptions of public integrity. <clears throat> Only 30% of respondents on average find it likely that the national government would be able to withstand lobbying by a corporation and 38% think it is likely that parliament can hold the national government accountable. So by reinforcing some of the checks and balances in the political system, including by strengthening the oversight function of parliament, we can further build trust and sustain support for representative democracy. Fifth, investing in reliable and fair 
public services. <clears throat> Our analysis shows that improving the speed and ease of service delivery has the largest marginal effect on overall citizens' satisfaction. Responsiveness to feedback is shown to be one of the key drivers of trust in civil service and local government. Uh, the upcoming OECD recommendation on human-centric administrative public services will provide concrete guidance on the design and delivery of reliable, effective, and equitable public services to ultimately increase satisfaction in people's trust uh, in government institutions. So looking ahead, uh, we are very keen to expand the coverage of the OECD Trust Survey to include non-OECD countries, and we are making progress uh, towards that objective uh, and we're making progress also uh, with a Latin American and Caribbean version. At the same time, we're conducting in-depth trust studies in Australia, Chile, and Slovenia to help identify best practices to strengthen public trust, assess concrete policy initiatives, and support dialogue and exchanges across and within countries. And yes, we are advancing the development of an OECD recommendation on information integrity to support countries promote information integrity across three areas, enhancing the transparency, accountability, and plurality of information sources, fostering resilience to disinformation, and improving governance and institutions to uphold information integrity. The forthcoming OECD Global Forum on Building Trust and Reinforcing Democracy, which will take place in Milan on 21 and 22 October, will draw on the results of the OECD Trust Survey in discussing better policy responses to support democratic values and processes. Trust in public institutions is essential for the effectiveness of government policy, uh, for our ability to navigate ongoing transformations in our economies and societies successfully, and for the strength of our democracies. Uh, thank you, and I very much look forward uh, to positive and productive discussions. Thank you, Secretary General Corman, for your remarks. I would like now to give the floor to Mrs. Elsa Pilichowski, Director for Public Governance Directorate at the OECD, uh, who will present the detailed results of the report. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Thank you very much to our Secretary General for opening this event. Minister Marcel, Minister Donohu, Minister Ikonen, Ambassador uh, Sabatucci, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and of course, good evening to all. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. I'm very, very pleased to follow up on the Secretary General's remarks and present the details of the results of the 2024 OECD survey on the drivers of trust in public institutions, which was carried out in October and November 2023 in 30 OECD countries. In today's uh, highly polarized environment in which a growing number of people are dissociating from traditional democratic processes, strengthen strengthening trust is a priority of our countries. Trust allows to bring people together and is also necessary to design and implement policies. With this survey, we aim to better understand what drives pe people's trust in institutions in our countries. The results that we will be showing today are trends for 30 OECD countries, but of course, each country has specific results that need to be interpreted with their own data and will here and there depart from our broad conclusions. Nonetheless, the results show very clear overall tendencies affecting OECD members and also reveal common areas of action for OECD governance. In general, the 2024 Trust Survey results confirm it is the processes underpinning democratic governance that need strengthening. This means ensuring all people's voices are heard, strengthening checks and balances among institutions, using better, transparent, and verifiable evidence in this decision making, and balancing the interests of a diverse population. All those are the best levers to improve trust, especially in national governments. Now turning to the results, uh, regarding the overall trust levels, trust in national government has slightly eroded since 2021, but not drastically fallen, and this despite increasing concerns about the cost of living and worries about the war in Europe and the Middle East. 
In 2023, around four in 10 people, 39% to be exact, had high or moderately high trust in their country's national government. However, an even higher share, 44%, had no or low trust, and 16% provided a neutral reply. These, average of, these averages, of course, uh, hide quite important variations across countries, with higher levels of trust in Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Mexico in particular, but also to a lesser degree, Canada, Belgium, and Australia, as well as Norway, Finland, Ireland, New Zealand, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Across different types of key institutions, trust varies also enormously between 63% for the police, 54% for the courts and the judicial systems, 45% for the civil service and local government, down to 36% for national parliament and 24% for political parties. Now looking at the evolution and focusing on the 18 countries where the question on trust in national government was asked in both years, we see that on average, the share of people with a high or moder moderately high trust in the national government declined from 43 to 41%. And the share with low or no trust increased from 40 to 43%. But this average hides important changes across countries and important differences. In particular, the share of respondents with high or moderately high trust increased substantially in Colombia and also in Australia, Canada, France, Latvia, and Sweden. At the same time, the share declined substantially in Norway, Finland, and Iceland. Although in Finland, the timing of the survey carried out in 2021 may have played a role. Turning now to the levels of trust depending on respondents' individual characteristics, what we are seeing is that among individuals on average for the 30 countries, the sense of agency affects trust levels greatly. For example, on average among those who report that they do not have a say in what the government does, 22% only have high or moderately high trust in the national government, while among those who feel they do have a voice, the share of high trust is 69%, which represents a 47 percentage point uh, gap between the two categories. In fact, trust in public institutions varies more depending on individual sense of political agency than on their socioeconomic and demographic char characteristics, although, of course, they are to a certain ex extent interlinked. And also, there is a 17% percentage point difference in trust levels depending on whether people have concerns about their own financial well-being. This is similar to 2021. But at the same time, when we look at changes since 2021, we see that women and people who did not complete an upper secondary degree have the largest decrease in trust in national government. The trust gap between men and women increased by six percentage points, and the gap depending on education levels by three percentage points. On the other hand, the trust gap depending on age has decreased by uh, five percentage points. In particular, very interestingly, trust levels among young men have increased by seven percentage points. The reasons for the increased gender and education related gaps are different. For lower educated people, it is the perceptions that they can participate in public life at the local and national level that has mainly worsened. As for women, on average, they have become more skeptical than men on government's capacity to tackle complex issues and also to ensure fairness in public services. On this point, we will need more research in the future. Beyond the evolution of trust levels, the arguably more important part of our work is to understand the drivers of trust and their evolution over time. When looking at this, we separate trust that is related to the day-to-day -day interactions between citizens and government, and trust that is related to how governments make their decisions on long-term policy issues. So first, on day-to-day -day interactions between citizens and public institutions, we note that they remain an important driver of trust and that today, current satisfaction levels are relatively robust and help maintain trust. For example, although there are significant variations across countries, overall, a majority continues to be satisfied with public services, such as health and education, as well as administrative services. They also, by and large, trust that public agencies will use their personal data only for legitimate purposes, 
which is of course very important in our increasingly digital societies. We should note, however, a decrease in satisfaction with the education and health systems by three and eight uh, percentage points uh, respectively, which we will have to monitor over time. These relatively good results on day-to-day -day interactions does not mean that we should slow down our efforts in these areas. First, they remain a very important driver of trust. And second, there is room to increase trust by improving responsiveness, openness, and integrity in those interactions. For example, 40% believe they cannot voice their opinions on matters at the local level, and 43% find it unlikely that the government employee would refuse a bribe to speed up a service. Similarly, fewer than 40% think institutions adopt innovative ideas to improve services or improve public services following complaints. This is now the concluding slide on day-to-day -day interactions with citizens. Here we have analyzed the drivers of trust together with the areas where actions will bring the most trust dividends depending on current satisfaction. This allows us to identify areas of focus for greater impact for different levels of government. All of the drivers that you can see here have a positive association with trust, even if today those on the right are levers that offer significantly more scope for improving trust than those on the left. So altogether, first, we see that the big opportunity for improving trust in local government on day-to-day -day interactions is in improving the capacity of citizens to voice their opinion on policy matters that affect their local community. Second, there are many levers for improving trust in the civil service. They include continuing to work on improving satisfaction with services, ensuring that people perceive that public employees treat everyone fairly, and that their personal data is used only for legitimate aims. Integrity standards also come very high on the agenda. Third, we also see that the potential impact of day-to-day -day interactions on trust in national government is smaller than on trust in the civil service and local government. But nonetheless, improving service satisfaction, the perception of legitimate data use and fair treatment can also play a role in maintaining and improving trust. Now, beyond day-to-day -day interactions with the, between government and people, which is relatively robust as we have just seen, we see more skepticism on trust in policymaking on long-term and complex issues. This is what is currently driving trust levels down. We can see that the majority are confident in the capabilities for emergency preparation of their government, 53%, but the sense of insecurity is evident when people are asked about their confidence in government's capacity to address complex policy challenges with trade-offs among population groups or generations. For example, only 42% are confident that countries can reduce their, green gas, their greenhouse gas emissions, only 41% that governments can regulate new technologies and help business and people use those responsibly, and only 37% are confident that government adequately balances the interest of current and future generations. Of course, Taking decisions on issues with large unknowns is obviously inherent, inherently difficult, so it is no surprise that some of the perceptions of the capabilities of governments on complex and long-term decision-making are less positive than on day-to-day -day interactions between government and citizens. But data also shows that this lack of confidence is at least partly attributable to the lack of confidence that institutions work in the public interest, that they are accountable to each other, and that they allow citizens to have a voice. Here we see that the public remains deeply skeptical that government always acts in the public interest and with integrity. For example, only 30% think it is likely that government would be able to withstand lobbying by a corporation for a policy that could benefit its industry but would also be harmful to society as a whole. In the same manner, only 30% believe the current political system lets them, have a, lets them have a say in what the government does, and this is highly correlated with trust in national government at the country level. Finally, handling complex policy issues also requires that citizens perceive that the government is making decisions based on substantial and robust evidence. However, on average, 
Only 41% of people currently think that government takes decisions based on the best available evidence, research, and statistical data. It is also important to note that this appears to be the biggest driver of trust in national government today. And it has to be related to the fact that only 20% think that government provided statistics allow to verify whether the government keeps its promises. Government evidence also competes with other sources of information, which of course are very crucial in democracies. And overall, we can see that the use by people of a diversity of media sources helps build trust and that clearer and reliable government communication can support trust as well. Moving now to the concluding slide on what actions can help improve trust levels on complex decision-making. We should first highlight that on average, actions to improve decision-making on complex matters are likely to bring more impact on trust than actions on day-to-day -day interactions with government. This is especially true at national government level. In particular, improving citizens' perceptions on government's ability to address intergenerational issues on the evidence they use in the, their decision-making, on ensuring citizens have a voice, we all have a particularly large impact on trust levels. Other actions to strengthen democratic governance will also have an impact, such as the capacity of parliament to hold the government accountable and the capacity of government to withhold undue influence when it takes decisions and communicate about these reforms as well. We find similar levers for improving trust both for local government and the civic service, although with slightly less impact. So to conclude on our report, the first lesson is that it is important to engage better with citizens to enhance trust in both local and national governments and make this engagement with citizens meaningful for, for decision making. This will require setting clear expectations about the role of the de deliberative, consultative, and direct democracy, as well as improving the mechanisms through which government give all people a voice and are responsive to these voices and supporting spaces and capacities for civic and political engagement. A second area for action is to strengthen the ability to transparently address complex policy challenges in the public's interest. This will be key to improving trust, especially for national government. Related to the above, countries need to support a healthy information ecosystem and invest in evidence-based communication. Promoting a healthy, diverse, and independent media environment remains key. Communicating on the evidence, research, and statistics that inform government decisions and how they affect the public, but also making sure this evidence can be verified and has solid and transparent governance behind should bring trust dividends as well. Fourth, all institutions should invest in improving perceptions of integrity in daily interactions and complex decision-making. Trust in all institutions surveyed would benefit from clearer rules and more advanced implementation related to integrity, lobbying, and influence, as well as anti-corruption. In the same manner, strengthening checks and balances in the political system is also likely to help build trust. Finally, governments should continue to invest in reliable, responsive, and fair public services, especially to enhance trust in the civil service and local government. Let me say a word of conclusion to highlight that these results overall should be taken with optimism. Indeed, our data show that it is on the core values of democratic governance that citizens have high expectations and that we can improve trust. Citizens' participation, citizens having a voice, the accountability and integrity of public institutions, the checks and balances within our political systems, as well as the use of verifiable evidence are all core democratic values on which we can all work to improve trust. This is good news, and we should all roll up our sleeves to meet these demanding expectations from citizens. Thank you very much to all, and allow me to thank the team in charge of the survey, in particular, Sarah Krups, Emma Phillips, Sina Smith, and Omer Metin, under the decisive leadership of Monica Brezzi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elsa, for sharing these detailed uh, results. I think there are a lot of takeaways for everyone uh, listening today. We have more than 500 people connected to this event. 
and uh, we will try to address uh, with the help of our distinguished guest. So let me introduce them for the for our discussion. We have Mr. Mario Marcel Culel, who is the Minister of Finance in Chile since 2022, and previously he was the president of the uh, Chilean Central Bank. Uh, it's the first time that Chile participates in the trust survey, although trust uh, is really at the core of the policy agenda uh, towards a modern uh, welfare state in Chile. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, we have Mrs. Anna Kaisa Ikonen, who is the uh, Minister for Local and Regional Government in Finland. Welcome. Um, Mrs. Econen was previously also a mayor of Tampere, one of Finland's uh, largest cities, and a state secretary in the Ministry of Finance during two governments. Finland has been a trailblazer in the work on measuring uh, trust in public institutions, contributed greatly to the foundations of this work, uh, including by carrying out an in-depth, one of the first in-depth country studies. Welcome. And finally, I would like to introduce Mr. Pascal Donahu, the Minister of Public Expenditure, National Development Plan, Delivery and Reform in Ireland since 2022. Um, Mr. Donahu is also the president of the Eurogroup since 2020. And previously, uh, he served as Minister of Finance in Ireland. Ireland, like uh, Finland, has participated in both rounds of the trust survey, and uh, um, we also have very much enjoyed, uh, and we thank Ireland for that, uh, for chairing uh, the, together with Australia, the advisory group that has helped sharing the trust survey. So thanks very much for joining us. We look forward for a lively conversation with you, and uh, I will uh, um, uh, move forward with the first question, but also invite those who are listening uh, to ask questions in the chat function. We will try to address as many as possible at the end of the panel discussion. So as uh, uh, we have heard from ELSA and from uh, the Secretary General Corman, one of the main levers to improve trust in national government today is to engage better with citizens and make this engagement meaningful for decision making. Uh, however, our survey results find that the majority of respondents still feel that they, they don't have a say in what the government does. So my first question for all the speakers is how relevant you see these results in your country and whether there are initiatives that your government has implemented or intends to, to reinforce citizen engagement. And I'd, I'd like to start uh, with uh, uh, Mrs. Econen, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And first, I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank the OECD for this extraordinary work. It is very relevant for, for all of us, and it, I, I think it, it's of great value and truly important basis for our policy making in, in all these countries. And uh, this has been proven by the previous report and uh, also in our case, uh, by the in-depth study of drivers of trust in public institutions in Finland that was published in 2021. For us in Finland, the question uh, of whether people feel they have a voice in our society, it's very crucial. And the results of this uh, trust survey also show the, show the same thing. Uh, we are a high trust society in Finland, uh, but with too little faith in the possibilities to be heard. So definitely, for us, further actions are also needed. We have already put this topic high on the agenda in our government program, and we state there as our objective that we will aim to strengthen democracy, engagement and trust in our society. One concrete action is that we are finalizing our national uh, program for democracy and engagement. A specific target for the program is to enhance the participation of children and young people. We also will uh, promote the development of good practices in democracy and human rights education. Furthermore, we uh, strengthen the culture of good discussion and exchange of opinions in our society. We need to highlight this also. It's vital that everybody in the society have an opportunity to listen and to be heard of current and, and future issues. 
future power belongs to everybody and therefore also the government and public administration uh, listening and uh, dialogue skills, they are very important. We need and we can learn to be better at, better at both of them. Also, I, I would like to mention our national dialogues, which is a tool uh, we jointly with a civic society work for better dialogues and uh, giving people a stronger voice. Anybody can participate in these uh, dialogues and anybody can organize such a dialogue. The goal between these, uh, behind these uh, dialogues is that we all could better understand each other in the Finnish society and at the same time get important information uh, for our policy making on, on how our citizens see the major challenges facing us. In the past few years we have had around 800 dialogues on various uh, subjects organized by uh, over 200 different organizations uh, and uh, this brings theme was uh, security and trust uh, and the youngest dialogue participants were actually only five years old so we really take also the kids along with us. Our ambition is to further strengthen this kind of cooperation. We have all the time wanted to reach especially those who are less well off in society and we are working closely with civic society organizations to make this happen. We also want to enhance the use of the results from the dialogues and what's more to even better show the uh, impact. And uh, coming to the next fall, next autumn, our theme will be what brings us together. And these discussions are also a way of, to fight against the polarization and pessimism in the society. It's sometimes difficult for different groups to um, find common ground and ways of encountering each other. And uh, conflicts and differentiation may arise, especially between generations and uh, cultures, occupations and livelihoods, urban and rural residents, and between majorities and minorities, as also the, uh, the OECD study showed. But we want to join people together and find new ways to bring people together. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, very interesting. I must say that on the national dialogues, we also know that this practice has been shared in particular with Latvia and uh, adopted uh, in a similar way with Latvia, Latvia. So I thought it was a point of interest. So the same question for Minister Marcel. Uh, any <clears throat> initiatives that you would like to uh, highlight on engaging citizens better? Thank you, Monica, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful to the OECD for the chance of uh, participating in this uh, panel, uh, especially given that uh, Chile is a newcomer to this uh, survey. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the previous administration was uh, not uh, uh, so enthusiastic as we are uh, in participating here, but we're catching up fast, given that, uh, as the Secretary General mentioned, um, there is a special in-depth uh, country study uh, underway on Chile that uh, we are looking forward to uh, know to <clears throat> to have it um, uh, published uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so um, now coming to this uh, to this uh, question, um, uh, well, I, I think that the, on citizens' engagement and participation, uh, there is a what a where and a how. Uh, and this is uh, not uh, does not have a straightforward answer because on the what, uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, when decisions, uh, when issues have a more uh, public good component, it's uh, uh, more difficult to uh, resolve uh, issues through consultation because uh, uh, there are no uh, mutually excluding uh, uh, access uh, to public services uh, or to public goods. Uh, so the more uh, the appropriation of, uh, of uh, uh, public services or projects or whatever, the easier it is uh, to uh, consult uh, directly with the public. On the where, uh, I think that uh, it's important to distinguish between policy design, uh, policy evaluation, and service delivery; those are different uh, dimensions of uh, of the uh, policy uh, cycle, and therefore um, the uh, uh, consultation is uh, perhaps uh, uh, different on these different stages. 
And uh, on the how, uh, I think there is a, a there is a continuum here that uh, goes uh, from, uh, of course, uh, uh, political system, representative democracy, to direct uh, democracy, stopping uh, with uh, many intermediate stages, uh, including a consultation with the public as such, and also a consultation uh, engaging with uh, civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, 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 for any any country needs to have a way of structuring uh, a consultation mechanisms, uh, considering these uh, these uh, three uh, different uh, dimensions. Now uh, coming to Chile, uh, I would uh, start by on the service delivery side uh, because uh, in Chile we have been applying a, use, a user satisfaction survey uh, since uh, 2015 that is applied to uh, in all, uh, in most uh, government agencies that are in charge of direct uh, service delivery. Uh, the latest uh, survey is, uh, has been applied uh, in 78 uh, Chilean institutions. Uh, we uh, publicized the results. Uh, the survey is uh, uh, carried out right after uh, having a, a direct engagement with this, uh, with a, a given agency. So it's uh, taken uh, with the immediate experience from uh, what happened in that uh, engagement. And then uh, we have uh, we ha have included a service delivery uh, as part, or citizen satisfaction with the service delivery as part of a broader framework of assessing performance of uh, government uh, agencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, this is now, uh, I would say, well uh, embodied into the way uh, uh, the center of government uh, oversees what is happening with the uh, different government agencies. And uh, this is uh, providing not only feedback, but also guidance uh, to what uh, uh, government agencies may be doing in this uh, regard. Um, the other issue that uh, I would like uh, to mention has to do with uh, consultation on uh, policy design uh, and uh, on decisions concerning uh, specific uh, projects, um, uh, both uh, private and public. Uh, in uh, Chile, both uh, um, concerning um, projects that have to do, that have uh, some potential impact on the environment, the environment assessment pro, uh, process includes a consultation with the uh, communities. Uh, it's a very, a, a very important component of uh, environment assessment. And now we are discussing some uh, reforms to that process that would move that consultation uh, earlier into the uh, investment uh, permitting uh, process on uh, environmental dimensions. Uh, similarly, uh, we have uh, adopted uh, very uh, broad uh, and uh, very strict uh, requirements on consultation with indigenous communities in all uh, uh, projects, programs, or whatever that have some impact on uh, territories that are uh, where indigenous communities uh, have, are, uh, are based. Um, now, uh, this is a, a very standard part of uh, project uh, program assessment and, and uh, decision making. And uh, the more we uh, make progress, the more the, the, say the, the technology or the methodology in dealing with this is uh, improving. Uh, finally, I would uh, like uh, to mention consultation dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, broader uh, policies. Um, that is uh, currently, uh, we as a Ministry of Finance, we have applied that, uh, for instance, on issues of concerning tax reform. Um, we developed a very broad consultation process at the beginning of the current administration concerning tax, re tax reform uh, 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 proposals. Um, we uh, carried out consultations in every single region of the country that uh, spread over uh, some uh, four months or so. But uh, a, an important issue related to this is that uh, when uh, we put together all that into a tax reform proposal, that was not uh, passed by Congress. 
And that uh, leads uh, to the final point that I wanted to make that is uh, pretty relevant in the case of Chile uh, concerning this uh, question of uh, citizen engagement, uh, which is um, the uh, how you balance out citizen engagement with uh, the functioning of a, of a, of a, a, a democratic representation through parliament, uh, considering that in Chile, uh, uh, according to the to the survey, uh, trust in the national parliament is very low. It's uh, lower than with the uh, national government, and it's the lowest of all countries in the survey. Uh, I will come back to that uh, later when uh, we move to, to separate issues. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, one should uh, look, uh, think of uh, citizens' engagement, not only uh, in terms of what uh, the executive branch of government or the national government uh, should do, but also uh, you know how uh, parliament uh, uh, takes up uh, this issue as a, a part of a, a broader effort to increase the trust in that institution. So I'll stop there, Monica. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for uh, uh, recalling us that this is not just uh, the executive power that has the responsibility of uh, building trust and uh, and so the the uh, combination with uh, uh, all the other um, uh, represent uh, uh, the representation of uh, democratic institutions so i will now give the floor uh, to minister donahue for uh, his uh, uh, answers on this question about uh, citizen engagement so uh, good afternoon monica and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and thank you very much for the excellent report and the very uh, sobering uh, conclusions that you have drawn regarding levels of trust across our societies. Uh, we really value and take very seriously our membership of the OECD and find the work that you do on trust and so many other areas so helpful for the formation of national policy and looking at how we can deepen our collaboration and engagement with each other. And in the report that you have done today, which we're glad to participate in again, I think you address a really central issue that we have regarding the future of our democracies, which is the trust that <clears throat> citizens have in how our political and democratic institutions function. And while Ireland does quite well on many of the measurements that you indicate today, we still need to do a lot better. And your report gives us some valuable insights regarding how we can do it. I'll just quickly identify three ways in which we structurally engage in voter and citizen participation outside of election time. The first one is by the use of citizens' assemblies. Uh, citizens' assemblies have been used to allow Ireland to assess different options for making progress and complex and indeed at times controversial social and health policy issues. And those reports and those assemblies have played a very valuable role in us trying to understand the collective views of our society, both on the issue and on possible options for making progress. And it was very fundamental to decisions our country has made with regard to the availability and the improvement of re reproductive rights within our country, with regard to marriage equality, and for example, with more recent issues with regard to drug policy. So from a social policy perspective, this has been really helpful. The learnings that I've had with regard to citizens' assemblies is that while you should use them, you should not use them so frequently that their value diminishes in the eyes of society. And secondly, you cannot outsource difficult decisions or thinking to a citizens' assembly. 
it still needs to be integrated into the work that the parliament and the government does. So we have procedures here in Ireland whereby the report from a citizens' assembly is shared with our government, and we also ask our parliament to consider that report both at plenary and at committee level. So that's the first positive experience that we've had. Secondly, and more from an economic perspective, before we do a budget in Ireland, and as we begin to prepare uh, our annual budget, we convene a meeting called the National Economic and Social Dialogue. And this is a meeting that occurs uh, normally in, well, uh, very early in the budgetary process, where we invite a variety of different organisations that are important stakeholders in the outcome from budgets. These are all civic organisations. It would range from trade unions to business organisations to charities, to organisations that are involved in our, our green transition. We have an open meeting uh, that is fully available to the public to view. And then we, after our open meeting, we have breakout sessions for each theme of the budget. And then the meeting concludes in a plenary where we hear the breakout reports on different themes of the budget. And I have found this a very helpful process for relating our budget making process to the views of organisations within our country. And then finally, Ireland is a member of the Open Government Partnership, a very, um, very important structure. Uh, through the Open Government Partnership work, which we're trying to revitalise and put more energy into here in Ireland. We now have a round table whereby we engage again at a um, through our civil servants and politicians with different organisations regularly within our country and try to explain to them the trade-offs that are involved in policy making. So outside of election time, which as a politician, I see it's been the main way in which we look for visitor, for, for voter and citizen engagement. We have those really, really important forms of engagement that are important. But having listened to your report today, I think we can even do better on in the time ahead. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, and thanks also for uh, reminding us that uh, any form of citizen engagement, such as the citizen assemblies, needs to be integrated in the in the work that the government and the parliament uh, do, and which is uh, similar to also what um, uh, Minister Marcel said before. So let me let me actually uh, go back to Minister Donohue for uh, our second question. Um, we have heard from the results that. Uh, in fact, there are in many countries there is a clear divide between uh, people being uh, relatively satisfied with the daily interactions with governments, which is uh, an important driver of trust, especially in the civil service and in the local governments. But uh, at the same time, people are more concerned about the government's ability to address uh, long-term complex issues such as climate change and others in the public interest and in a transparent and accountable uh, manner. Manner and these concerns are driving trust levels uh, down. So um, I would like to ask you uh, what are the implications of these results in your country and uh, what kind of interventions uh, you believe are more meaningful to both the trust level at different scales. So we, we are talking about local and national governments, but also uh, civil service, so which by the way, we received some questions already in the chat where this question are also of uh, how trust uh, um, differ and can be enhanced across different levels of governments is something that uh, the participants are asking you to address. Thank you. You thank you very much, Monica. Yes, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Monica. And 
let me again just identify a few ways in which I think we can look at how we can further build trust. Um, the first one is if you really value making progress on something, you have to measure it. That's why I think the work that you are doing is so important. And it's why it's very helpful to participate in these surveys on a regular basis. Uh, we have a, a public service strategy that looks at how we can support and develop our civil servants and the work they do within our country. And one of the outcomes that we measure in this work is trust in our public services. So an output from our strategy for our entire public service is trust and building trust. Um, uh, secondly, I think a, a way of further building trust is to explain to citizens the work that we are doing to try to get ready for the more complex challenges that will develop in the future and what we are doing to look beyond the urgent issues of today. Uh, we have just uh, set up uh, two new funds here in Ireland to help us prepare for the impact of demographic change in our society in decades ahead and also for the impact that a change in climate will have on Ireland. And the government, particularly at ministerial level, spends a lot of time in our media explaining why these funds are needed and explaining the role that they will play and help us deal with the complex challenges that you refer to. And then finally, and briefly, could I say that I think it's very important for governments to communicate the good work that they do um, uh, through the institutions of state uh, to citizens and um, explaining progress and communicating how the state can make a difference appears to me to be part of the solution to the issues that you are identifying. And if I look, for example, at other work that the OECD does, the really brilliant work that you do in measuring educational achievement and attainment across different societies. It strikes me that if a country is making progress in this, we should be using a survey like that to explain the role of education, how the state invests in education, the impact that can have in living standards and life prospects and our freedoms, and use that as an example of how the state delivers its social contract. So in summary, on that point, if the state is doing a good job, we should tell people and make the case to people that it's doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So maybe uh, we'll pass the floor, uh, Minister Marcel. So whether this divide uh, uh, between uh, satisfaction with uh, with um, with the daily interactions with the public services uh, and instead more concern on the ability of governments to address complex and long term issues. Uh, uh, what I mean, how this uh, reflects in Chile and what Chile can uh, how can Chile address that? Thank you, Monica. Um, well, in uh, answering this question, uh, I think it's important to note that in the case of Chile, the relationship is the opposite to the, uh, to the OECD average. So uh, people uh, have more trust in policy making or in the capacity to address uh, uh, broad policy issues than in the civil service. Actually, uh, trust in the civil service in Chile is one of the lowest of the OECD survey. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let me uh, speak of each, each uh, of uh, both. Um, and uh, in dealing with, uh, with the civil service, I think it's important, uh, I, I think there are a couple of issues to, to note. First of all, that um, um, in Chile, the notion of uh, civil service is not uh, uh, well understood because uh, in Chile, we do not have a distinction between the civil service as an institution as compared to uh, public employees as a broader concept. Uh, uh, basically, uh, all people that work for government 
are under pretty much the same rules, the, uh, independently of uh, whether they are um, highly qualified uh, professionals or they are uh, clerk uh, employees. Um, and uh, on top of that, uh, people uh, basically work for agencies rather, for, rather from the government as a whole. So uh, when people are asked about uh, civil service in Chile, or uh, as they understand, as a public sector employees, they think more of the people that they see in daily interactions, be it either in uh, health care or in uh, applying for uh, some uh, benefit or something. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue related to this is that in Chile, we have had traditionally for many years a very low interpersonal trust. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, when you look at uh, other surveys, say the Gallup World Survey or so, Chile is one of the lowest in terms of interpersonal trust. So my, uh, the, the way I see this is that uh, this, that low interpersonal uh, trust combined with the view of, uh, of um, the public service as uh, basically public employees as a whole, uh, combines to generate this uh, low uh, trust in, uh, in the civil service. That is not easy to change, because uh, not only because of these uh, sort of more structural issues, but because uh, changes uh, that is uh, happening, because uh, you know the more we use uh, technology uh, in public service uh, uh, delivery, uh, the lowest is the uh, direct uh, uh, contact with uh, public uh, employees, and therefore uh, sort of a prejudice against uh, uh, public employees is not very easy to change, because uh, uh, as we move ahead. There is a, a lower and lower face-to-face uh, -face, uh, engagement with uh, with the public servants. Uh, now, on the issue of um, of uh, um, addressing uh, broader policy issues, um, uh, I think that uh, something that is uh, part where Chile partic uh, ranks particularly high is uh, in addressing uh, environmental issues, uh, uh, gas emission reduction, and so on. And uh, I think that the, the trick there is that there has been a lot of continuity of uh, policies across uh, government, as, uh, across administrations. Um, and the people have seen a lot of consistency in the way uh, government is acting upon uh, these issues. And uh, that uh, gener certainly generates trust. Um, in uh, Latin America, it's uh, pretty common that uh, you know we have change in government and the new government, uh, you know, is very critical of the, their predecessors and wants to start everything again. Uh, but uh, I think that in, in Chile we have uh, perhaps uh, more continuity, even, I mean, despite uh, broader uh, political changes. And uh, this area is uh, one of those that is pretty salient in that uh, regard. And now, of course, uh, you know, continuity in uh, policies it's not an issue, you know, it's not just an issue of uh, willingness, uh, but also uh, has to do with the way in which policy is uh, designed, how much you engage different uh, stakeholders, uh, how, uh, uh, how high is the profile of your commitments uh, to policies. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in this uh, case, Given that uh, Chile is one of the countries that is uh, uh, much higher at risk from climate change, I think that has uh, contributed uh, to make, uh, uh, you know, to create this uh, political consensus and political continuity uh, much stronger and more visible to citizens. And that I think is uh, 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 partly uh, having an effect on this, uh, uh, the answers to these uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And same question for uh, Minister Icon. And uh, uh, Finland is a high trusting country. We know that you already uh, said it. Uh, what are the challenges you see uh, in even bolstering 
uh, trust in national government and consensus on uh, regarding uh, uh, complex uh, policy issues and uh, long term decisions. Thanks. Thank you. I would like to uh, take up two aspects. One of them is uh, proactive governance and the other one is impact. And I start with the, with this proactiveness. And when it comes to the uh, situation in, in Finland, I would say the old truth still uh, uh, stands and the Finns are very good in the times of, of crisis. And uh, we are good in reacting and getting our actions rolling when something uh, sudden comes up and uh, this definitely generates public trust. We also have a long tradition of uh, doing foresight and future work uh, to be better able to respond and uh, shape the future and actively tackle the difficult and complex issues that come up. What we are not so good at uh, and uh, where future action is, is needed is how to use this foresight information that we gather. Uh, we have worked closely together with the OECD and European Union to find ways to fill this strategic uh, gap, uh, impact gap, uh, in our joint work on anticip anticipatory innovation uh, governance. How to better use the foresight information in, in policymaking and in our core steering processes by civil servants in their work is essential. Uh, in being prepared and, and in, in shaping the future. And this is especially crucial when we talk about complex issues that need this kind of long-term um, commitment over political election cycles and, and need to work across uh, different sectors. We think that one important aspect here is the language that we use. Uh, it, it also uh, builds trust and, and we have seen that in our country, 10 to 14% of our people need this kind of very easy language uh, in order to be able to navigate in the society. It's very uh, difficult to trust in something if you don't understand. Uh, and uh, we are putting emphasis on how to make our decisions and reforms easier to understand, to, to make this uh, understandably, understandability better. As a concrete tool, we have, for instance, prepared an e-training on easy language to all civil servants. Uh, the importance of easy to, lang uh, easy to understand comes even truer when we talk about uh, complex issues of the future. They are uh, difficult issues already per se, uh, and we have to be able to make them more understandable to everyone. And this, this links to what we have discussed earlier on having a voice. If you cannot uh, understand, it's difficult to have a voice. And also uh, on the reverse side, we also need to remember that trust is also uh, always a two-way street. And if it's not possible to understand us and what we do, how could you feel that you are trusted by your government? So it's very important to, to look at it both ways. Then coming to the impact side, uh, we have quite good uh, evaluation culture in different projects in our administration. We have ex ante, interim and uh, ex post impact evaluation and close cooperation with universities. Besides this uh, assessment and the evaluations of uh, individual pro projects and continuous monitoring of our government program, implementation and impact, it's crucial that we also look at more uh, long term and holistic impacts. And there will, therefore, we have the uh, Strategic Research Council that finances high quality science of, of uh, social significance and impact. And currently, there is an ongoing program that focuses on democracy and uh, how global crises um, requiring radical social reforms, such as uh, climate change or loss of species or armed, armed conflicts, how they uh, challenge uh, democracy. And when talking about this um, information and research data, it's good to remember that uh, what the OECD has also pointed to us that in this work on anticipatory uh, governments, that we need uh, information also directly from the citizens. And here I come back to what I mentioned in my earlier speech about the uh, uh, national dialogues. They are the kind of concrete tool uh, that also OECD has recommended and it's essential to remember that 
when, when we talk about this issue is that um, the society does not change only through uh, our government decisions, but through people's actions. And th therefore, not only we get uh, the important information through the dialogues, but they also uh, provide an opportunity for people to think about things, uh, to increase joint understanding of the challenges, and in this way lead uh, to actions that can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And let me pause uh, here. And before uh, we open for a few questions from the audience, I'd like to give the floor to the ambassador of Italy, to the OECD, uh, Mr. Luca Sabatucci, uh, who can provide some remarks on the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. OK. Thank you, Monica. Honorary, uh, honorable ministers and dear colleagues and dear virtual participants, uh, uh, this launch event uh, um, not only marks uh, the end of a wide-ranging process involving six, uh, six, uh, 60,000 respondents across 30 countries, it is also the start of a common journey on how to frame together the policy responses to the challenges stemming from the OECD survey, a process that is already feeding into the preparation of the global forum that we will host in Milan, Italy on October 21st and 22nd, as mentioned by Secretary General Corman. The OECD has placed these, the issues of restoring citizens' trust and strengthening the resilience of our democracies at the center of global forum. We will discuss how to reconnect institutions with rising citizen expectations around participation and representation in the first plenary session. And we will continue to share our best practices and policies responses during the ministerial lunch. Thanks to the efforts of the Public Governments Directorate, we are in line with the mandate of the Luxembourg Declaration adopted at the PGC Ministerial Meeting in November 22. And we look forward to the adoption ahead of the Global Forum of the OECD recommendation on human-centered public administrative services as a common policy framework to support adherence and the development of services with people's needs as the principal consideration in their design and delivery. In this journey towards more effective and human-centered public services, the trust survey will be our common compass. This is uh, the first time that Italy takes part in this process. We did so being fully aware that citizens' trust represent an essential pillar for democracy. The decision to submit uh, to the scrutiny of its citizens uh, is a decision that obviously requires a certain amount of courage on the part of governments, knowing that the results will pose challenges. The survey points out how the perceptions of the public governance drivers of trust in Italy are generally in line with the OECD average. In some cases, as in the perception of responsiveness of public institutions to innovative ideas, we are above the OECD average. For other drivers, as the as for the easiness of availability of information of an administrative procedure, we still have work, homework to do. However, our government is already taking action and, and providing policy responses we will be happy to share with our OECD partners. In particular, we are surging our public communication channels to increase citizen awareness about public service delivery and to reduce the lack of information about administrative services. I will provide just three couple of examples. Under the patronage of the Minister for Public Administration, Paolo Zangrillo, a monthly roadshow was launched in January 2023 with the claim, Facciamo Semplice l'Italia, let's make Italy simple. Once a month, the Department for Public, for public Services hosts a one-day workshop in a different Italian municipality to foster a citizen 
and stakeholders dialogue, dialogue on issues such as public service attractiveness for younger generations, upskilling activities for the digital and green transitions, simplification and digitalization of administrative proceedings. So far, 12 workshops have been organized in large metropolitan cities, as well as in mid-sized towns. A further flagship initiatives aims to strengthen administrative capacity in peripheric and disadvantaged areas. In January 23, the Department for Public Service and FORMES, the in-house body for technical assistance to central and local public administrations, started a three-year capacity building program in the municipality of Caivano, located in one of the most disadvantaged peripheries of Naples, aimed at restoring an effective, transparent, and accountable local government. To conclude, our governments uh, today stand at a critical juncture. They are tasks that we navigate in simultaneous, simultaneous transitions and overcoming paradigm shifts. First of all, reducing polarization, fragmentation, and policy uncertainty. The final communique of the G7 summit in Puglia, attended by OECD Secretary General, acknowledged the common commitment to safeguarding democratic processes and to supporting international initiatives, in particular in the UN and OECD, towards the promotion of trustworthy information sphere and of vibrant civic sphere. In this high stakes environment, building and maintaining trust in public institutions has emerged as a, a priority for all of us. Trust in public institutions is the bedrock upon which governments rely to make policy choices to tackle pressing challenges. Therefore, let's tackle this challenge together, now at, at the Global Forum in Milan next October. We look forward to meeting you there. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We look forward to the groundbreaking discussion at the Global Forum in Milan, and we invite also everybody to register and participate uh, in October uh, in Milan. Thank you very much. So maybe we can, uh, we still have some minutes for uh, a few additional questions to our panelists, uh, uh, questions that come from the, uh, from the Zoom chat. So I have, uh, uh, the first uh, question, uh, given the importance of evidence on trust and the tendency to manipulate evidence and news, uh, how concerned should we be about this link? So that's a, a question for uh, all the three panelists, and maybe I will add another one uh, from the chat uh, about the, given the, um, the uh, gap in trust uh, for young people, how can we uh, engage youth uh, in order to, to build trust and future for, for them? So this is a, a two questions. Uh, I don't know if there is a, any of you who wants to start addressing them. On the evidence uh, uh, and the risk of information and uh, and then uh, something uh, more on the please uh, minister donohu so i i might begin with just uh, two quick responses if i may firstly with regard to how we can build up trust amongst young uh, our young citizens <clears throat> it appears to me that how we teach politics in our secondary schools and when <clears throat> citizens are young is a really, really important element of how we can build up trust. Uh, having a module and as part of your curriculum in your schools, an explanation of how the political system works and what impact it can make and also what your duties are to us, I think is really, really important. Um, I think it's really improving, but we can't lose sight of that. And then finally, and very briefly, on the relationship between 
the manipulation of evidence and data, and again, then your point on trust, uh, uh, an important part of how we handled that in Ireland, particularly during the pandemic, was the role of our media, and in particular, our uh, publicly funded broadcaster, which is uh, completely independent of the government, but put a lot of focus into explaining the science and health background to the different decisions the government was making. And that element of our media played a very, very helpful role in maintaining trust at a time in which we were under huge strain. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Any additional remarks on these two questions? Uh, please, uh, Minister Iconen. Thank you so much. Very good questions, both of them. I start with uh, children and youth, and I think it's uh, very important that when uh, when you meet uh, the young kids already in the kindergarten, in the in the daycare, that you have them uh, along in planning the days and, and taking their, at the level that they are, uh, taking them along in the decision making and giving them possibility to maybe uh, plan the Christmas food, what is uh, what is being served or how the program of the day, what, what they are, uh, that they take part in, uh, in uh, what they are doing. So taking the level of, of what age the kids are. And in the decision making, we have the youth, uh, children's parliaments and the youth councils. And uh, I think they have been very good ways of, of taking uh, youth uh, aspects along in, uh, in the decision making. Uh, in my home city, uh, we have had the, uh, all the um, councils, the youth have been present in the decision making, even the city council meeting, the youth have been taking place and, and uh, giving speeches there. And it has been very relevant. They have been so informative and, and the mayors have these kinds of um, questioning hours for youth. So there are many ways of, of uh, taking youth along, especially at the local and regional level. And also and at the national level, there are many ways and, and also how we use the, the social media where they are present. So uh, to be innovative in this way. Then we come to the other question. Um, uh, this kind of this information is a big challenge in our societies right now, and and it's very important that we keep uh, developing this kind of um, uh, open governance and and give this information as open as possible and and uh, promote this kind of openness. I think it's the best way to to fight it, and even uh, keep explaining the the difficult issues. Sometimes it's uh, it's easy to uh, in the in the social media. The, or in the news, the, the headlines are very short and very shocking. And, and the truth is that the, the challenges that we are facing are very complex. So it is very important that we take this holistic perspective and try to explain and, and in, in the uh, understandable language so that people understand. And also that when we meet people in our services every day uh, in the public sector, that these um, uh, encounters there are, are the ones that strengthen the uh, trust and also how the leaders behave, how they, they lead their organizations. They are also the examples of uh, building the trust. So there are many ways to, to bring this forward together, but very relevant question to handle. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Marcel. Do you want to add uh, anything on uh, the evidence and misinformation? Yeah, sure. Um... Well, first on the issue of um, uh, engaging uh, young people, uh, the gap in Chile in terms of uh, trust is not that uh, large as compared to people of other uh, age uh, uh, groups. But uh, in, uh, in my view, uh, a, a very important uh, factor uh, with uh, young people is uh, in the use of technology. Uh, uh, young uh, people are used to have instant information, instant uh, responses, and uh, I think that everything that the government can do in terms of uh, providing uh, um, fast access uh, to data, to information, to respond to queries and so on, uh, as well as to speed up uh, uh, procedures uh, in applying to something or uh, uh, developing certain uh, certain project or something, uh, I, I believe that that uh, is uh, very 
uh, responsive to the kind of uh, approach that the, the younger generation is having to all issues of, uh, of uh, everyday life. Uh, now, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm uh, more concerned uh, with the gap that appears uh, in trust uh, on uh, government institutions by uh, level of education, because uh, you know, seeing that uh, trust is, is lowest for less educated people is a, a sort of a, 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 a shocking, concerning that uh, given that uh, you know governments are supposed to level the playing field. Uh, so if we cannot, uh, you know, uh, generate uh, uh, more trust with uh, less educated people, it means that we are not performing well one of the main uh, uh, responsibilities of government. And uh, concerning the evidence uh, manipulation, um, I uh, would say that, uh, I mean, first of all, it's important to have uh, 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 trusted uh, brokers of information that uh, uh, that have a stronger may have a stronger uh, saying uh, concerning uh, data evidence and so on uh, uh, for instance the experience with uh, with uh, fiscal councils in many uh, OECD countries including Chile has been extremely useful in in terms of uh, you know um, a, a, a conducting a, a much richer discussion of fiscal issues, just to give an example that is closer to us. But uh, above all, um, I think that, uh, you know, on um, a manipulation of evidence, uh, uh, fake news and so on, uh, I think that uh, uh, we as uh, policymakers and uh, public officials have to uh, spend, uh, to dedicate much more time, much more effort to explain, to educate, to bring information to people, to take time uh, to make it uh, 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 much easier to understand what we're trying to make uh, through policies. I believe that uh, for many years, perhaps, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, educational uh, or communication aspect of a uh, of, uh, uh, public uh, of uh, government work was not that important. Uh, today, I believe it's uh, absolutely central. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, this brings us to the end of uh, the this event and the panel discussion. We have many uh, other questions from, uh, from the audience, so we will try to address them. Uh, and maybe involve again uh, our distinguished uh, guest. Uh, but uh, I'd like to thank again the Secretary General Corman, uh, the ministers who joined us today, and all the participants. Uh, you will be able to access uh, in open format on the OECD website the report, the country notes, and also the data. So uh, everything is available now on the on the OECD website. Um, I really thank the the ministers for their time and uh, this engaging uh, conversation. As for the future of the trust survey. Uh, we will uh, repeat the survey every two years, so the next results will be launched two years from now, around uh, mid-2026, and we hope uh, with even more participating countries and to expand uh, the coverage also outside uh, the OECD. Thanks again, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you.